So hello everyone, thank you very much for coming today. Um, uh, the work we're talking about is in a quite preliminary stage. You can hear me okay? You can hear me okay? Okay. Quite a preliminary stage, so it's really good to have a really good turnout of interesting people to help us figure out what we're learning um, and uh, how we should be messaging this stuff. Um, the, the project that I'm, we're talking about today is called Demanding Power, and it's all about energy protests. Um, but it's part of a larger program, which is the A for EA, which is Action for Empowerment and Accountability, which is a different funded program working in fragile and conflict-affected settings, chiefly now Burma, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Mozambique, but previously also Egypt. So contexts which are fragile, conflict-affected, in which public authority is very fragmented. This is one of four work streams in this current phase of this program. Um, I'm Naomi Hussain. I'm at the Accountability Research Center at American University and also IDS, yes, also IDS still. Uh, Umer Javid, who's an assistant professor at LUMS in Lahore. We have Dr. John Agbonifo, who is a professor at Ocean State University in Nigeria. Dr. Euclides Gonsalves, the director of Kaleidoscopio in Maputo in Mozambique. And Professor Tade Aiken Aina, who's the director of the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research, um, which is based in Nairobi. So we have a good range of speakers for you today. I'm going to kick off by telling you a little bit about what we've been doing and why we've been doing it. Um, and then our uh, leads for the Pakistan, Nigeria, and Mozambique teams will talk a little bit about the emerging findings. Tade will, will uh, end off with talking about why all of this matters for policy and practice. So, oops, there we are. So, you know, who watched the news last year? Who was, who was in the news last year, in fact? Anyone on a climate strike last year? Yeah, some people, yeah. So all of this is going on. Greta Thunberg is going off about fossil fuels being the, the devil's spawn and all that, and all that's true. But at the same time, we've also been having enormous numbers of other kinds of protests around the world. I have catalogued nine in the last year, in 2019, massive energy-triggered protests that... that, that went off into quite significant national political crises. I got here a picture of the Gilets Jaunes movement in France, which uh, instigated this huge listening um, uh, process by the, the President Macron, uh, which I think none of the Gilets Jaunes activists actually took part in, but several million French people did. Uh, and this was triggered by discontent around um, a, a new tax, a proposed tax on fossil fuels that many rural French people in particular did not like. There was also the Sudanese revolution, which was triggered, among other things, by fuel shortages and fuel price rises, as well as bread price rises. So I think the, the, the starting point for our work here is that you can have some quite apparently mundane sorts of concerns, mundane sorts of problems. I haven't got electricity. I can't afford to run my motorbike anymore. And these somehow transform into these really quite major uh, political crises. How does that happen? What does that mean? Are people uh, empowered by these struggles? Do they manage to hold their governments accountable? I think it's very striking that you have these two very opposing kinds of movements going on in the world currently, the one saying ban fossil fuels and the one saying we need access to affordable energy. And I think these are some of the, the, the contradictions, the paradoxes that we have to, to think about in the politics of energy and politics of climate going forward. So this is really where we, we started with this. Oh. Wrong way. The background to this research is actually that we started off uh, a few years ago, uh, a group of IDS colleagues and researchers in, in Kenya, Mozambique, India, and Bangladesh did a, a, a study on food riots. And uh, it, uh, food riots during the global food crisis period, 2007 to 2012. And there it turned out that fuel was quite a significant factor in a lot of these, these protests, not only because people feared that rising fuel prices would... Uh, trigger rising food prices, but also because in, in Maputo you couldn't get around because you couldn't afford your chapas fare anymore. Um, so we had some ideas, we had some concepts, we thought we could apply those uh, to the study of protests around fuel. When we were approached to do some work for this A3A program, we realized that in each of the countries that A3A was working in, there had been really quite significant episodes of fuel-related protest. Uh, in each of these countries in that period, in, in, in Myanmar, famously, they had the Saffron Revolution, which was triggered by a, a, an energy price rise, a, fu a fuel subsidy cut, in fact. Uh, since 2018, I've counted 
quite significant protests in more than 20 countries around the world. Um, so there seems to be, I mean, somebody would have to do the numbers on this, but it seems to be on the rise as a phenomenon. Um, and it's very clear that those people who are pro promoting fossil fuel subsidy reform, the, the whole movement around fossil fuel subsidy reform, emanating chiefly, it must be said, from the IMF and related institutions, um, have identified mass protests as a deterrent, but haven't actually managed to understand why these protests really happen and how they, they get big and how they become really politically potent. Um, Davide Natalini, who's also in our team, is at Anglia Ruskin University. He did his PhD on fuel riots, and he found that there's almost no literature on this subject. So energy-related protest has not been a, a big subject of uh, contentious politics research in comparison, stark comparison to food and other sorts of issues. So these are the real reasons why we came to this topic, how we came to this topic. I keep doing that. These are our research questions. We want to know how it is that when people take to the streets over, say, a fuel subsidy cut or electricity shortages or whatever it is, whether these protests actually give them any power, whether they get stronger as a result or whether they just get tear gassed and sent back to the, to the, the shanties or the, the, you know, the towns. Does it, does it actually work to hold public authorities accountable? So empowerment and accountability are really key concepts for what we're looking at here. We think also fragility, so authoritarian rule, fragmented political authority, the threat of violence and so on, also have some role to play in explaining why apparently quite mundane struggles grow into these major crises. Um, and these are really the, 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 the core part of the, the research, but we're also very interested in the roles played by transnational actors. So these struggles take place at the national level, they're national political struggles, but they're greatly and heavily influenced by various different transnational actors, whether it's the multilateral agencies or uh, commercial interests involved in you know, building dams, or as we realized recently, state commercial interests like the, the government of China or the government of the US, which are um, investing heavily. Investing is perhaps not the word. Anyway, spending heavily in countries around energy issues. So these are, these are some of the things that we're really concerned with. Oops, and again. Um, so a really core concept for us, um, and this arises also out of the work on food riots and out of European social history, really, is the moral economy. And I won't go into great detail about that, but I think it, it, it's a way of saying that the politics of protests, there is a kind of justification, a leg legitimating, if you like, idea, because energy has become very, very central to everyday life. And when you hear people's, what people are protesting about, they say... Uh, now that the fossil fuel subsidies uh, cut, I can't afford to get to work, I can't afford the bus fare, I can't cook, um, you know, the factory has shut down where I work and so on. It becomes a matter of basic subsistence. So it's not just, you know, 200 years ago it might have been food, even 10 years ago it might have been food, but now it's fuel as well. You cannot live without fuel. How would you cope if you didn't charge your smartphone? I mean, many people rely on these things for work and so on, but for many reasons, so it's very central. We draw a lot on contentious politics theory and social movement theory in this. We are focusing on trying to understand particular episodes of contention, the mechanisms through which they come about, the factors that give rise to them and their effects. We have two main elements to this research. We have three very in-depth country case studies, which our team here will be speaking to, which involves quite standard te uh, techniques of uh, using media content analysis, FGD, focus group discussions, key informant interviews with policy elites and also with protest activists. But also, I think quite innovatively, we are looking at the way in which energy has featured in popular culture, um, social media and so on, because this has become so much more important a part of protest movements. And we're also doing, and Davide and Neil McCulloch are very involved with this, we're doing a, um, a, a big end quantitative analysis to identify <clears throat> quantitatively uh, the, the drivers and the correlations between different aspects of politics, um, uh, the economy and uh, energy protests. So this is all going to come together, ooh, in the next few months in a really brilliant way. So we had, so we're really focusing on particular moments where contention, where, where protests around energy really reached peak. In Mozambique, there were these moments in Nigeria, 2007, particularly 2012, and in Pakistan, particularly around 2012. In Mozambique, I should say, we're looking at both fuel protests and e electricity protests. In Nigeria, we're only looking at fuel 
electric-related protests because they're very significant there. And in Pakistan, we're only looking at electricity-related protests. Um, I wanted to show you these, uh, these examples on the right of, of the way fuel has uh, featured in popular culture. The top is a, a still from Azagaya's, Azagaya's a Mozambican rap star. And in fact, he was the co-author on our working paper on this subject, which I think is very cool. Um, and he, uh, he was very influential in the 2010, wasn't it? 2010 protests. He had a, an infamous song that turned into a ringtone, which was a kind of call to arms for the protesters, uh, power to the people. And I think he did uh, some time in jail for that. Um, this one I love. You see the, the one in the middle, the fuel. This is a, from Nigeria. It's a chap who's holding on to sleeping with his jerry cans because fuel has become so precious in Nigeria. They have some really hilarious ones from Nigeria. Very typical, uh, great Nigerian sense of humor, I think, there. But also from Pakistan, you see what happens to your eggs when you leave them in your fridge because there is no electricity. <laughs> so I'm now going to ask each of our uh, country team leaders to, to speak a little bit to, first of all, what are the mechanisms that turn protests around energy, quite mundane, specific protests around energy, into national political crises? You've got two minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Is it Is audible? It okay, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Naomi. So in the Pakistan case, what we were basically doing was we documented uh, sort of a universe of electricity-related protests that had happened between uh, 2005 and 2015. And we were able to find up to about 528 separate incidents of protest uh, that took place around this time period. Uh, but what was quite telling was that m some of these protests would actually come together in the shape of much larger forms of contention. So these would be multi-day, uh, multi-location protests often would turn quite violent. So out of the entire universe of protests that we had, about 30% became uh, explicitly violence, which involved either coercion by uh, the state, so by police retaliation of some sort, or by burning down or arson of public uh, buildings, vehicles, and so on and so forth. Um, so some of these major episodes of contention, there was one in uh, October 2011, then another one that we in particular are studying in depth, which sort of has two phases, an earlier phase in April 2012, and then another one in June 2012. And the June 2012 becomes really violent, and we end up with uh, multiple casualties, uh, deaths, um, you know, injuries, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people protesting in different locations across the entire country. And so the interesting question that we want to explore is what made uh, this shift take place? Why was it that from localized protests around service delivery, temporary disruptions to supply, what we call unscheduled outages, so everyone expects a certain degree of outage, but when that expectation is breached, uh, people sort of coming out. And so the, at the heart of it is the grievance. And the grievance was that electricity is seen as a fundamental right by citizens now. It is very much intrinsically seen as part of the social contract that they have with the state. And that social contract is repeatedly violated uh, through the presence of unscheduled load shedding. That gives you the grievance part of it. But the mechanism that translates it from a grievance to an active con form of contention for us was electricity outages affected everyone. So it wasn't just non-elite actors. It wasn't just workers, laborers, um, you know, farmers. It was also large landlords. It was businessmen. It was marketplace vendors, traders. Uh, all sorts of, of, of groups were involved in mobilizing against it. And I think that sort of really broad-based mobilization allowed it to become such a a pervasive phenomenon and would obviously contribute to uh, the degree of centrality that it had in political discourse uh, around that time. What also was particularly true for the Pakistan case was that uh, it, it mapped on quite well to anti-government sentiment and anti-government mobilization, especially in the largest province of Punjab. Um, where opposition political parties were able to utilize this underlying resentment against outages and translated outages, corruption, inefficiency, all of that bundled together into uh, sort of broader discontentment. And it was channeled through the shape of public protest in which the trigger would often be these large scale outages. Um, and then uh, ultimately, I think what allowed this to, uh, uh, again, you know, move from one locality to a, to a larger scale was also just the diffusion of, uh, of the grievance through both things like pop culture. So uh, discourses around outages uh, dominated everyday conversations pretty much across uh, mainstream media, across uh, social media. Uh, people would often communicate in terms of the first question would be, uh, how many hours of outages have you had over this time period? Uh, and this would be true regardless of what uh, sort of you know, income group or what social economic profile uh, you actually came from. And I think all of these things, uh, you know, and, and on top of that, I would 
argue that the, the fuel that sort of sets all of this on fire is the fact that this is happening in June and temperatures in Pakistan, um, you know, approach 50 degrees in many parts of the country. And so when you, you don't have electricity, you obviously, uh, uh, you know, you're obviously going to feel very angry about all of this as well. So I think a lot of this has come together and we're sort of start passing through these different pathways that allowed for this shift in scale. Uh, but what really is, what strikes us from our field interviews, from speaking to members of people who were, uh, to the communities that were protesting, is that it was seen as a major violation of their uh, relationship with the state. And that electricity, which is so not, which is conventionally categorized as a commodity by the state, as a commodity that you have to pay for, is conceptualized by citizens as a right. And it should not be uh, predicated on their ability, its presence should not be predicated on their ability to pay, but rather on the fact that they needed to survive to participate in society. Uh, so I think that's the underlying grievance that we were able to sort of document. Great, thank you. And John, how about in Nigeria? How thank did these things spread and scale up? Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the question actually uh, draws our attention to the difference between why and the how in contentious uh, politics scholarship. Yeah, we are looking at the how. How do we move? What factors, you know, trigger the movement from grievances to uh, mobilization, to action? A lot of people are aggrieved, but they don't do anything about it. Well, in 2012, there was a major uh, fair protest in Nigeria because of the of deregulation by the Jonathan government, the removal of fair subsidy governized a protest against that government in 2012. And uh, maybe the first thing to say, uh, to let us know, is that fuel is fundamentally life in Nigeria. Because you need fuel to be able to make a livelihood. You need fuel for heating. You need fuel for cooking. You need fuel for so many things. So when you are denied access to fuel, it's like being denied access to the air we breathe to life. So that action affects everybody, like my colleague has said, very negatively. But uh, moving on from there, there's something that is very, very fundamental uh, to our understanding of how uh, protest becomes a national crisis in Nigeria. We have, up until now, a very powerful labor movement in Nigeria and a vibrant civil society. The implication of this is that we have existing structures in social movement scholarship, they call it resource, um, um, uh, resource mobilization. We have existing networks of protest. We have existing leadership, both in the labor movement as well as in, um, in um, religious organization or sector. So, be as a result of these existing resources, whenever there is a protest over hike in fuel prices, such protest immediately goes nationwide because these resources are nationwide. They are not localized. They are not limited to any particular part of the country. And usually the protest begins like this. The government increases fuel price, and then labor calls out the government by issuing a warning strike. And this warning has a way of priming up citizens, <coughs> of conscientizing citizens to the fact that, look, we are going to strike on a particular day. Mm -hmm. And mind you, these are already angry citizens. Mm -hmm. These are citizens who are already dissatisfied, discontented with the government. So everybody is put in the mood for action. And then when that day comes, everybody spill onto the street. But this is just one mechanism. A second mechanism sometimes occur when uh, usually labor would need to consult amongst themselves, sensitize the citizenry before taking action. So usually they will give the government be a week or two weeks notice. But sometimes protest breaks out before the notice. And uh, to a very large extent, uh, we have a group of people we call area boys, street urchins. Uh, maybe homeless people. They are not crazy, they are, not, they, are, they are perfectly healthy and normal, but it's just that they don't have somewhere to sleep. So they sleep on the street. So it's very easy for these guys 
who sleep on the street to wake up that morning and begin to set up bonfires. And then passers-by joins them. And before you know it, a seemingly innocuous action turns into a very big, contentious episode. And looking at episode itself, uh, we have seen a situation where contentious um, mobilization or protest turns into a carnival sort of event. We have a situation where uh, musicians, artists, you know, were invited and they entertained the audience. Mm. We had a situation where uh, what we call sachet water, pure water, uh, bottled water. It's not really bottled, but in sachet. <laughs> are giving out free to participants, and sometimes they are giving something to eat just to uh, incentivize them. You know, imagine what would happen if you were home and your neighbor returns to tell you, ah, I was giving rice at that protest this morning. So you have something to look forward to, especially if you don't have access to free rice <laughs> or if you are not sure of your meal that following day. So the following day, you are likely to join. And before you know it, the protest has gotten larger and bigger. So these are some of the factors of forces that really contribute to us having um, a very innocent protest over for a turning into a major crisis. And then, of course, the action of security forces could also contribute to this phenomenon. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, John. If you could pass to you, you please. Thanks. I mean, it's, you say carnival, but actually these are quite violent incidents. People do die, have died. In 2012, they did, didn't they? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a... It's not all fun. Um, let's hear from Mozambique, Euclides. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Mozambique has a, a history of, of protest that is um, different than the one of Nigeria uh, in the sense that the mechanism that uh, was used uh, for the escalation of the two major protests that we had related to fuel in 2008 and 2010 um, were SMS messages. Uh, back then, WhatsApp was not what it is today. It was not there. Um, and people exchanged information by uh, sending SMS. So in, in 2008, um, there was cons consecutive uh, hikes, uh, sharp hikes uh, in the price of of, um, of fuel in a very, very short periods of time. Um, and that uh, led to the first uh, pro national protest. Um, in 2010, um, there was uh, a hike on the price of, of, of fuel, uh, not as, as, sh as, as sharp and higher than the 2008, uh, but it was associated with, with hikes of prices of foodstuffs, mm -hmm. uh, in, in particularly bread. bread. Um, so if you think of the centrality of fuel uh, to economy, um, like the Mozambican economy, um, you realize how the, uh, the hike in the price of fuel spills over to, to other um, products uh, that citizens need um, for their uh, basic everyday uh, livelihood, especially, this is especially so uh, in the capital cities, um, and in particular in Maputo, the capital city of Mozambique, which has been uh, the epicenter of these uh, major protests. Uh, there where you have um, a higher level of in in inequality, so the poorest, uh, some of the poorest uh, people in, in, in the country will be found exactly in the, in the capital city. Um, so these uh, sharp um, hikes in, in the price of, of fuel have also taken place in a context in which there was uh, a climate of general dissatisfaction with, with the government, um, growing uh, living costs uh, rising uh, on an annual basis, um, and these these announcements of sharp uh, increases in the cost of fuel in a short period of time uh, have taken citizens, have put citizens in a position in which uh, they really had no alternatives. Uh, 
So from our initial findings, uh, we are hearing from, from, from the participants of our studies that every time um, they receive <coughs> notification of uh, information that prices are going to go up, they start planning accordingly, uh, changing their lifestyle, changing their, their routes and their routines. Um, but when they happen in the, at a very, very short notice and across the board, affecting pro all the other related products across, across the board, they really have no option other than, than the pro to protest. And as I, I said in, in the beginning, um, there's no a face, there is no group of um, uh, street children or youth um, who are ready to be activated. Uh, to participate in the protest. There is no network. Um, it's just people receive S SMSs they do not know from, from whom, uh, and uh, they forward these S S SMSs. Uh, we've received the, the, the news of the, a strike, uh, of, of a high price hike that is going to happen, take place from tomorrow, from after tomorrow, and in three days we should, we should strike. And this often uh, takes place. So in 2008 and 2010, um, these um, protests happened. Uh, in the history of Mozambique, they were, they, they, they were novelty. Uh, so the government was, was not really prepared. They'd never seen the citizens going to, to the streets and taking on violent protests. Uh, and of course, they have taken up the, the experience from those two protests and started um, asking uh, citizens to register their, 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 their SIM cards uh, to make sure that uh, they're at least able to track the source um, of, of the initial source of, of, of these SMSs. And in, in 2012, uh, there was another rise in the price of, of, of fuel. Uh, by, by then, um, the, the government issued messages discouraging uh, citizens to attending to, to these protests uh, and also deployed the, the military in the centers uh, at, at the particular nodes um, of the city where these protests uh, <coughs> tend to, 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 to erupt. Uh, ultimately, there was uh, one and a half days without um, violence, but in, in which uh, people really did not uh, stay at home. Mm. So. The simple answer uh, to, to your question, what is the mechanism that leads to the escalation, uh, is a context of uh, uh, larger dissatisfaction with government performance, uh, but the short, uh, short notice and high rise in, in price of fuel uh, that are then uh, circulated by SMS. Uh, messages. Great, thank you, Cleo. So we have quite a variety of mechanisms going on here. We have uh, the media and popular culture playing some role everywhere, discontent with government, it seems, playing uh, some role everywhere. But civil society, labor unions, political opposition, present in different ways, working in different ways, um, and government repression, repression appearing at different times. I think it's really reasonably well known that when governments call out the tanks or the tear gas, bring out the tear gas, that's usually when these things get very big because people are outraged. We, uh, I want to ask, and, and maybe we'll be a little bit briefer on this one, um, if you could just very briefly describe what you think was the main outcome of the, of, of the main episode of contention in each of the countries. Um, Umair, what about Pakistan? Um, so uh, I think uh, there's, a, there's a bit of lag in terms of what the outcomes are, but I think we can trace them back to these main episodes in any case. So the period that we're looking at specifically between 2008 and 2012, and you have a number of incidents that happen in between, um, I think one major outcome that does happen is that electricity and the supply of electricity becomes uh, sort of almost the single most salient issue on which political contestation is now taking place in the electoral realm. So ahead of the 2013 general election in Pakistan, electricity becomes a central plank of the political opposition. Um, and the party that ultimately wins the 2013 general election does so on the promise of restoring electricity supply. And uh, even though the problem wasn't, obviously they weren't able to fix it within a short period of time, what they were able to do was essentially mobilize a lot of Chinese funding uh, up to almost $37 billion in Pakistan's electricity sector. Uh, so in terms of a short-term consequence, electricity just simply became the one political issue on which uh, essentially electoral politics at least hinged on. Uh, and the outcomes were quite clear 
as the election results unfolded in, in 2013. It's pretty decisive then that it yeah. had quite a significant impact. How about in Nigeria? L less, less optimistic story in Nigeria, I think. <laughs> I became very happy. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I became very happy because the price of uh, fuel was reversed. It was brought low. I mentioned to uh, Neil a short while ago that naturally I was anti removal of subsidy. And he laughed, said, You are a Nigerian, so you should be against <laughs> removal of subsidy. But uh, I'm beginning to have a change of opinion and view. Uh, but um, more seriously, uh, one of the outcomes was that uh, government reversed itself. A second outcome was that it gave citizens the feeling of efficacy, the feeling that they could hold government accountable, the feeling that um, they could uh, have a voice mm. and shut down society, and government will have no choice but to listen to them. And I think uh, one other factor that we have not really, outcome that we've not really paid attention to is that increasingly, uh, fair protest is conferring larger and larger legitimacy on the labor movement. Because the 2012 protest got to, almost got to a tipping point where citizens were beginning, or protesters were beginning to ask for a revolution for the overthrow of the Jonathan government. And it got bloody in so many places. Labor had to step in. And labor became the tempering element and when the government decided to negotiate, it was because it had the leadership of labor to negotiate with. So to my mind, I think over time, labor is, is, is acquiring a lot of legitimacy, at least as far as the government is concerned. Where to citizens, they feel labor sold out. Mm. So those were the outcomes of the protest. Great, thank you, John. Euclides, how about Mozambique? Well, in, in the case of Mozambique, the, the first important outcome was um, that the, the price was maintained um, as a, a response to both protests. In the price was? They were reversed. reversed. The hikes were, were reversed. Um, and um, um, subse subsequently, uh, there were price hikes, uh, but these now came uh, better paced and uh, shorter, shorter increase. Um, and uh, looking at, the, at uh, from now backwards, uh, we see that there is a routinization of um, uh, negotiations of, of the announcement, at least of the announcement of, of, of the price. <coughs> so uh, before the government would, um, would simply decide um, on, on the on the on the new prices in, and inform, uh, but now they are they are developing mechanisms to to provide detailed information of why prices are going to go up, uh, often referring to to global markets uh, and when these prices are going to go up, giving people some um, some more room to mm. to prepare. Uh, in any case, it's it's still um, uh, we. We are still in a situation in which uh, we don't have formalized institutions where uh, citizens can voice their, their, their concerns and uh, engage in formal negotiations. Uh, but if we compare uh, with the years prior the protests, um, at least there is some level of answerability mm -hmm. that has, has been gained uh, as a result of this uh, experience. Great, thank you. Um, Tade, I'd like you to take us uh, into the, the realm of, so why does any of this matter? What does this matter for, for policy and practice, for accountability, empowerment, but also for energy, energy, for fossil fuel subsidy reform in particular? Thank you, Naomi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've done about almost a year of field work and research. We've actually uh, used uh, a set of sophisticated methods and some of our findings are coming out together and we are finding commonalities in these findings. First, we are beginning to see that what we are talking about is a really heavy amount of resources, a lot of money in subsidies, that these are sectors in which there's tremendous investment, mm. 
both internationally and locally. So these are sectors that this is this uh, this sector we're talking about. It's really a very important strategic and significant sector in our countries. It actually constitutes almost the lifeblood and has implications for policies and uh, budgeting, uh, how we run our, our three countries. There's a commonality of that. We have also found that these sectors are opaque, they lack <laughs> transparency, they are governed by technocratic and, and, by technocratic and bureaucratic principles mm -hmm. and leadership. So they are not accountable to anybody except to themselves because they actually, so the language is framed in a technical and technocratic way and the language is not accessible to the ordinary citizen. In the meantime, uh, the citizens themselves feel, because you should remember first and foremost that our three countries are countries with high degrees of inequality in many ways. Mm -hmm. They are countries with extensive poverty. They are countries where uh, also from the perspective of the colonial project, there's a, like one of our colleagues said, uh, uh, there's almost a paternalistic thing. The mm -hmm. political elites have actually framed the relationship between state and citizens in terms of what do we give you to believe in us? Mm -hmm. And the subsidy issue is tied around this. So a part of the decolonization project in our very countries is breaking this bind between you know, the, the way the relationship is constructed. Mm -hmm. So our citizens see this relationship between subsidy, between because they don't get anything else from the countries. The roads are bad. Uh, the, I mean, they are taxed in certain ways. They feel that this is a social contract that these subsidies represent a kind of right. So we have to have a way in which, and this puts the, our countries in a very interesting bind. We are, they are caught between a very difficult bind between making sense of their economies in terms of the relationship between the subsidies and the amount of resources and revenues and uh, expenditures involved, and the leakages, because this, again, these sectors are corrupt. There's a lot of corruption in these sectors. There's, you know, lack of transparency leads to a lot of corruption. So our countries are caught in a very terrible bind between making sense of the economies, reforming the sector, and the need to create more transparency, and balancing the demands and rights of citizens. We think the only thing they are getting out of the country is a subsidy for fuel, and of course, the new demands of the globe uh, of, of, of the world, the global demands of the climate crisis and climate change, that is really critical and challenges, you know, the way we use fossil fuels and all of this. So that's something. And the policy implication of that is that one, we need to democratize the oversight of this sector in all our countries. We need to make this sector, the managers and the runners of this sector, accountable to some kind of legitimate legal structures and relationships and in a way in which ordinary citizens can actually question it and see what is going on there. So that's one. Then number two, I think it's also important that we need to change the narrative and the relationships from the way the demand is structured now. If we democratize it, if we make it transparent, then we can really explain why some of the demands are not sustainable and we can show the directions in which whatever savings are made from this subsidy issue, how they are used. So citizens can claim it's not, the, it's not a Jonathan telling citizens it's about sure P. You know, sure P is a social protection strategy. So we, uh, citizens themselves have a hand in determining what the proceeds are in a legitimate and systematic way in which they have, I mean, uh, they, they claim their citizens' rights and uh, obligations. So that's another thing. And um, I think there's a, uh, so we're saying a key policy element first is democratizing the oversight, making sure that they're legitimate, correct oversight. The second policy situation is the need for communications, for this 
sector to be transparent and for citizens to be able to understand what's going on in this sec sector without any degree of technical esoteric. So it's not, <laughs> it's, not about a, it's not about a cult in which the language, or it's not about my good old church in which mass is said in Latin when everybody speaks Yoruba. So, <laughs> so it's something about a language in which the communication hmm. is clear between the citizens and the leaders. So that's also another interesting policy issue. And then that leads to larger democratic uh, rights. Uh, and we, we, we were exploring the transferability of uh, when we're talking about empowerment. You've taken part in these strikes. When I, was a, uh, when I was a young student in Lagos, I used to have a senior guy who says, don't be at the back of that demonstration and don't be in the front because the police bullets can catch you. <laughs> be in the middle. And, if you are, because you are surrounded by the group, don't throw a big stone, throw a small stone. <laughs> but what, 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 it's, well, what we are really saying is that we actually need to understand the nature of political participation and political mm. engagement. And how mm. we can, how, you know, citizens that are empowered in this process of demand making and protesting can actually become citizens that make other kinds of demands in other areas of their lives. Citizens can demand that we want to see the budget. Some of that work is going on in Nigeria. Budget mm. and co are doing that mm. kind of work. Citizens that can demand that we want you to tell us what you have spent our money on. So those are some of the kinds of things that we can say are gains and uh, lessons from this in terms of policy, uh, policy implications. We are looking at a wider area as a group and uh, this afternoon we did an exercise, and I can remember John, uh, Professor John Gaventa, telling us that we were too ambitious in some of the, all kinds of the policy implications of this work. But it's something to, you know, it's something to think about, and we, and we are working on it, and what's important is what is doable, mm. and what is achievable over a particular point of time. Great, thank you, Tade. And I love the fact that your professor gives you advice on how to protest. I, Hope you're getting these lessons at IDS as well. Um, yes, absolutely. So we are going to yes. Very quickly, as part of that joke, if you stay in your hostels in Nigeria in those days, that's where the police are coming first. So they never catch the protesters because the protesters are in a crowd. They catch those who are not protesting, who are staying in the halls of residence. Great. So we're we're going to now have some time for a Q and A, and we'll break at two, and then we're actually going to finish at two fifteen. So um, I'm going to take three questions. Uh, could you please put your hands up? And the first question always goes to a woman. <laughs> because research shows that's the right thing. Please say your name. Um, and, uh... My name is Abir. Um, thanks. I'm a PhD student um, at SPRU. And my question is regarding, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for interesting insights. Um, my research is actually about the diffusion of renewable energy in a conflict zone, which oh. is Yemen. And uh, uh, um, my question is regarding the, uh, the case of Mozambique. Um, you mentioned that um, some of the reasons why um, some of the uh, protests turned into um, violence was because it was sudden and, and people didn't have time to prepare. So my question would be, what sort of strategies would people actually prepare to um, account for the uh, increase in price? Great. Thank Thanks. You. We're going to take three at a time. Miguel. Thank you. Um, this is more a question for Euclides to reflect on, which is um, Euclides. you get the feeling that in, 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 in the story of Pakistan, Umer kind of brings out a political party as a broker, that they said, look, vote for us, we'll come to power, we'll fix the electricity. Sorry, we won't fix the electricity, we'll give you the electricity. Um, John's case in Nigeria was the same thing. You, have, you get the, f the feeling that there's the unions playing a role of brokering between citizens and the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in Mozambique, there's a silence there of who's brokering Euclides. What's going on there? We'll take one more. Robert. Wait for the, wait for the microphone, because so everyone can hear you. They're recording about, this, by the it's way. It's about the, the compare, comparing uh, these riots and protests with others, mm -hmm. which have got other 
characteristics, or ethnic or political, more overtly political. What about the attitudes of the so-called forces of law and order, the police and the army? I mean, they are also affected by these prices. Their families are affected. I mean, are there yeah. indications, for instance, that the families might be exercising pressure on them to make them more moderate for this sort of protest? That's a very good question. This, by the way, is Robert Chambers. He didn't introduce himself. I guess he thought Sorry. he didn't need to. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we have three. Um, I, I want to take the law and order forces question, uh, but Tade may also have some views on that. Um, Euclides, you have some questions to answer. Why don't you go? Uh, what are the strategies people use to prepare for, for price hikes? Um, one of the exercises that we did uh, and we continue to do because this work is in progress is actually do a mapping of energy use um, among uh, the, the group of citizens that we, uh, we are interviewing. And um, we are finding that people, people have access to they use electricity, they use gas, they use um, kerosene, um, they use wood. Um, and, um, and in their, their lifestyles, uh, they're increasing um, electronics. Uh, so, so in the case of, 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 of electricity. Um, so back in the days, you would have one old TV and a radio probably. Uh, now you have a TV, radio, microwave, uh, fridge, deep freezer, um, and so on, and the list goes on. So, so what happens is that each household has different sources of energy. Um, and, um, and what they do when they they realize that prices are going to go up. They, they start adjusting uh, how they manage uh, those sources. So if you have a, 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 a fridge and a deep freezer, you may choose to start using one of the, of the mm. two or using uh, your, your deep freezer for 12 hours of the day. Um, and in terms of the cooking, um, you also distribute. Uh, the foods that take much longer uh, to cook, you may want to use um, the energy sources that are, that are cheaper. Um, that is in relation to, to, to electricity in particular. Uh, in relation to fuel, um, well, in the middle of the year, you can't change uh, the place where you work uh, or where you, your children go to school. Um, but you can make arrangements with your relatives uh, on how people transport with your colleagues and how, how you move. Mm. Um, so, so those are the strategies, the kind of strategies people, 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 people um, develop. And uh, the, the costs of coping are quite high, aren't they? I mean, people can cope, but it's, it's, it's painful and it's annoying. Yes. And people complain about it a lot, yes. don't they? Yeah. What about this question about why uh, in Mozambique the protests seem to be very spontaneous, whereas they have more organizational form in Nigeria and Pakistan? Well, um, I don't have a definite answer for, for this question, Miguel, uh, but I would, I would imagine that one would have to look at, at, at the history of state, um, state society relations in Mozambique, mm. uh, the kind of government, uh, the kind of dynamics of civil society. So uh, if we put <coughs> the protests uh, around fuel uh, in, the, in, in that broad historical context um, of the development of the democratic space, which is very, very recent, uh, then it starts to make sense. Um, I mentioned earlier that the government was not, did not ever occur that this could happen. Uh, it's exactly because there was no history to it. There was no past. Um, we are coming, uh, this happened in 2008, um, from, to, from 1975 to 1992, um, Mozambique was a um, single party regime country, so the first elections we're in 1994, and in fact, since 1975 to today, it's the, it's the same party that is in power. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've never moved. Uh, so the kind of relationship that they have and the type of accountability uh, that they practice uh, is still very much predicated in the old model of a single party, party regime. So this was not expected. Um, and then on the side of, of, of citizens, there was also, other than the party-related organizations, there was no, and religious organizations, there was not really a vibrant civil society or uh, types of groups that would organize around the, 
social concerns. Um, and, uh, and you can imagine also the levels of, uh, of uh, fear of confronting, mm. confronting um, authority are there from street level authorities to, to the high authorities. So, so that's why this, this protest happened at, at the moment uh, when um, people have no other alternatives when they, 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 they yeah. feel they've been pushed to the, to the, against the wall, uh, in fact. Um, and um, one thing that is, is coming out from, from, from our research is, um, yes, the, those leading the protests and, and being on the streets um, are youth and women uh, uh, primarily, but there is also a, a broader group of society, including elites within the ruling party, who then at these moments provide support because they are, in, they are in this general disagreement with the state, uh, with the way the country is being run. Mm. Uh, so that's why, that would be my uh, provisional explanation for yeah. why is it possible that in Mozambique yeah. uh, we've got these spontaneous um, protests that emerge uh, only yeah. on the basis of uh, SMSs and uh, mobilization via popular culture. So you see the, the value of the comparative analysis here. We get to see what works in, in one country but doesn't in the other. Your point about, your question about the security forces is very striking in all of these episodes that it starts off with the police being very mild. Mm -hmm. They're almost always very mild because mostly these start off being very peaceful protests and there's a very strong sense and it comes also from the, 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 from the government, usually, that these are legitimate, peaceful protests. We, we should accept that people are having a hard time and not clamp down too hard. And it only is when it starts to escalate and becomes a really big national political crisis, when it moves beyond the question of fuel to the question of political and economic governance, that you start to see the tear gas and the uh, riot police coming in. So there is a moment when, and, and you know, low-paid police everywhere, they're probably not usually the lowest-paid uh, workforce, it's true, but, but still are affected. So we do see this in some, of the other, in some of the other protests around the world in particular. Can we take another round? Yes. And any questions for Nigeria and Pakistan? Um, so, yes. I'm sorry, if you could introduce yourself at the back there. Um, thank you. Uh my name is uh, Amro. I'm from, um, from Sudan. I can't hear you. Sorry? From Sudan, did you say? Yeah. Hey, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you. So um, the, we've had a very painful experience with the issue of fossil fuel subsidy reform and, and lifting, and it's very, very complicated. Um, that is, in one side, it has escalated into, I don't know, some call it political crisis, but we like to call it a revolution. Um, so now we're, we're, we're kind of in the middle of this very complicated challenge um, where um, like reforming coastal fuel is critical for any economic uh, uh, reform, but on the other side, it can only be, uh, can only happen on a democratic uh, uh, like mm. approach. Um, so my question is about how these, uh, like the, 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 this, it was mentioned that the communication is, is critical in this, um, but how is it linked to, to, to the democratizing the whole um, energy sector and the engagement of, of citizens in, in deciding um, uh, how this can be? Uh, we're seeing willingness among our citizens that they're, they're, they're willing to, to, to share the risk mm -hmm. if they're if they have, if they are engaged in taking the decision and deciding even the sequencing and timing of this process, mm. uh, which, which from past experiences cannot happen like at once, mm. especially when we have a, such a fragile economy, uh, but there's also, on the other hand, a very strong political will to yeah. move forward. But well, is, there, is there a question or is it a comment? What would you it's, like, it's a question like to of how, on how, how these, how communication strategies can be combined right. with, with with the goal of democratizing the energy sector in mind. Great, good question. And then Ian. Uh, 
I'm intrigued to know who the citizens are. All of you talked about citizens, but in a very undifferentiated way. Some have <laughs> fridge freezers, some don't. Some, <laughs> uh, so, some are area boys who don't even have any accommodation. So it's a highly differentiated group who these citizens so-called are. And I was just surprised that class, gender, social difference more broadly in conditions of highly unequal societies with widespread precarity hasn't been central to your analysis of contentious politics, or maybe it has. Not in the two-minute slots, but yeah. So there was a, a, a question here as well. Hi, Shalewa. I'm originally from Nigeria, and I had a question on Nigeria, twofold. The first one being, in, with the recent, well, the 2012 uh, riot strikes that happened, there was a sense that the unions had sold the people out. Um, mm. Have they recovered from, the, from that in terms of reputation? And have they, essentially, what avenue did the people have to address any aggravations they may have, given that the unions are not solely exclusively for them? And then you also mentioned with regard to the mobilization, so there's a strong resource mobilization in Nigeria through these avenues of CSOs, etc. Why are they not utilized for other grievances such as security? So there's a huge issue of security in Nigeria and it may not equally affect everyone, but it is not just this, a certain elite of people. It is starting to become a bigger issue. Why is there not mo more mobilization of other issues beyond fuel? Yeah. All very good questions. Thank you. This has been great. So I'm going to allocate these questions. Tade, you could take the question about Sudan because this democratization of, of, of energy reform is yours. Uh, John, please uh, tackle Nigeria. And Umer, I'm assigning you to class and gender and why we didn't do it. <laughs> Here we go. Let's be brief because well, people need to leave in yeah, very quickly, a few minutes. In relation to what one might call genuine democracy, Communications is important in terms of the flows across from, you know, those uh, citizens and rulers and openness to engage this structure. So all of these are important in that. So when we talk about democratizing the sector, is that who actually provides the governance? Who are the key players in the sectors answerable to? And you do know that these sectors, they have, you know, most times you have state oil companies, you have, international, uh, you have international oil companies, you have local businessmen, then you have the bureaucracy, and then of course in some cases you have the military. They are actually a very important part of this. And then you have all the networks of patronage and networks of graft involved in the system. So being able one to have applicable clear rule of law elements in terms of penalties for doing the wrong thing is very important. And being able to impose those sanctions, it's one. Second, making sure that this sector is open. It publishes its data. We know what deals is doing, what kinds of contracts, who's uh, procurement, who's winning the tenders, and how much, you know, how the revenue is shared. We don't find that in a lot of our countries. So that's a second one. That's part of this democratic governance, but it's almost a tech. But then having them report to somebody else beyond a clique of directors yeah. created by yeah. government or created by the oil companies or created by the marketers is also something very important to which we citizens can then make those people account. And Ian, about citizens, and the question that you wrote, I, I mean, excuse me, I just wanted to, I thought that was important because I yeah, used Yeah, good the word, question, yeah. We citizens. It's actually really a differentiated and diverse group. But we found out that basically, and the Umar will say that about uh, Pakistan, actually the people who really do mobilize the resources of protest are not the really, really bad of people. They are, they are the political barons. They are the leaders of the petty business associations, the commercial groups, uh, the local government chieftains. So there's some kind of, uh, I, uh, these days class is a dirty word, so I might use some kind of socio-economic differentiation <laughs> among the collectivities that are involved in that, in that arena. And of course there's gender we heard about. The, in 2012, the women of Daura, 
protested. But of course, Daura was linked to CPC and Buhari, and that's his hometown. But in other protests, women's relationship is different because even the streets in terms of protests is not a, a particularly benign arena for women. We saw that in Tahrir Square in, uh, in Egypt. In Nigeria, that happens too. They're open to sexual harassment. They're open to all sorts of things. But the second thing is that women are not in the hierarchy of the Nigerian labor movement, like John told us. And again, even though the pains and sufferings of this, all of this has tremendous consequences for women. They, I mean, you see their participation on the streets are different. Even their, the households they come from, people will say, you don't go out there. So all of this introduces a different gender dimension in terms of the direct street protest. But the other analysis is who are the people who bear the burdens and pains of this? And that's a much more, that's a complex analysis that shows that the burden falls more on the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. I think the really interesting question about class in this is that compared to food riots, which tend to be kind of quite uh, urban poor centered, f the fuel riots seem to be spread across different kinds of geographies, small towns as much as big towns, but cross class. This is the very significant thing about them. They almost always have a cross class element which was absent in food riots. Uh, let's hear about Nigeria, John. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the question was whether citizens have recovered from the feelings of being betrayed by the labor movement during the 2012 uh, protest. Well, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit difficult to see, but I did ask respondents, uh, people like Ayo B. Uh, about this issue, and uh, what she said was that uh, the situation is complex, very complex. We are having a um, we are having a scenario where many guys in the labor movement are career oriented. They are looking forward to building a career and what they can gain from the labor movement. So they are not really in it you know, for the sake of protecting the interests of citizens. And then there are a few core unionists who are really committed to the cause that will have these variations within the movement to deal with. Uh, but one thing that is important is that after that episode in 2012, there was this general belief, a rumor, that um, the labor leadership was settled by the government. They were compensated, they were bribed. But there's no evidence. Nobody has any evidence. It's all here, see, so far. So um, there's no way we can tell until maybe we have another episode of uh, a hike in fuel prices. Then we'll be able to, to tell whether uh, that collaboration between yeah. civil society and labor uh, hood or not. Then, uh, uh, when the second question referred to the mention of uh, available resources to protest movements in Nigeria, why those resources are not deployed in others? Yes, one of my respondents um, did say that a protest over fuel, hiking fuel prices, uh, has not empowered the citizens to uh, be able to demand accountability in other sectors of life in society. It's not that the resources are not there, but for some reasons that is difficult, that are difficult to uh, unscramble, I, I, we do not know why Nigerians have not mobilized against corruption, for example. Corruption is a debilitating phenomenon in Nigeria, but Nigerians have never mobilized against corruption the way they have mobilized against uh, hike in fuel prices. So how we are going to make that transition, I don't know. So that's the situation for now, thanks. Great, so Umer, if you could talk to us a bit about what, when we say citizens or people, actually what are we sticking in that category? I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's uh, data out there. Uh, we've done some work on in Pakistan's case, but also I think in Mozambique and Nigeria uh, that shows that it's a pretty 
broad cross section. It's okay. not limited to a particular demographic. Uh, we have data that shows what occupational profile was of the protesters. Um, uh, there's an interesting split in gender, at least in terms of Pakistan, that women, uh, older women, uh, were involved in protests mm -hmm. in uh, major urban centers, uh, in particular, which were sort of protests that were localized, community-based protests. Uh, but in smaller peri-urban localities, it was largely young men, um, men who were linked to uh, pre-existing networks like political, uh, uh, sort of clientelistic networks, uh, associational networks, uh, factory workers, for example, uh, mobilized by local labor unions. I think all of that, uh, yeah, and, and so there's, there's an interesting sort of diversity, and I think that in itself is uh, part of our, that, 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 that really informs us why, why these protests have uh, uh, carry so much importance and why they sort of influence uh, politics in the way that they do. Uh, it's probably because of that, the, the wider cross-section and the kind of networks that are mobilized uh, for it, because it clearly affects uh, you know, pretty much everyone in society in, in various ways. Well, in theory, we have five minutes more, but let's see. Any more questions here? Yes? Richard and someone there. I think those last two will be the last two. Yeah. Please, please keep them brief and the answers brief. Yeah. Um, first, wonderful. Very interesting. Second, Thank you. have you been collecting data, for example, different fuel prices and how they've increased in the previous five years or one year, whatever, fuel, etc.? And the third point, um, the police and the political, evil political powers must be very interested in your uh, findings. Have you thought of that? I know, yes. know the CIA in the States and the, are very interested in um, anthropological surveys mm. and um, how to prevent crises or mm. protests must be a nasty um, thought by some nasty people. Good questions. Yeah, there was one back there, and then we'll pick those up very quickly. I don't know, John. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tamilur from Bangladesh. A very basic question, just to know that why government decide to hike the prices of the fuel? Is that all economic for all of the countries or any other cause? Oh, very good question. We should have answered that earlier on. That's right. There's one very quick one here, John. Very quick. This is less a question to the panel and more to you to think about and advise us after. We've, it came out a little bit here. We've discussed the, the contradiction that Western governments are urging these countries to move to cheap, to, to non-fossil fuel economies. Yeah. And, and a lot of talk to do that. And yet the real subsidies they are given and investments they are given are to continue to promote these economies. 90% of the tr new trade with Africa announced last week went to oil and gas at the same time they were talking about the need for clean energy. Yeah. But what the donors haven't addressed is how they encourage countries to move to cheaper, to, to non-fossil fuel without dealing with this juggernaut of the political settlement yeah. between states and citizens, yeah. that if they try to make that transition, there will be real revolt, which keeps those countries from yeah. Yeah. doing it. So how we square this debate with the climate debates, we want to see your advice and thoughts on. Yeah, big, big challenge. Um, I think I will probably take these because we're running out of time. Uh, Richard, very good question about, uh, you know, what's the CIA going to do with our results? Um, it has been a concern. This kind of research is always uh, ethically very tricky. Uh, we do not think we are in the business of, of giving the IMF, you know, a guidebook to how to avoid protests. Um, nevertheless, they are learning some of this themselves without, I think, arriving at the conclusion that the sectors need to be democratized, they need to be inclusive and uh, participatory in the way they arrive at um, uh, policies. And of course, some of this is, is it, it sounds a bit naive. These are high security, national security, international security sectors. So to say, let's have the, the, the people of the slums uh, involved in the decision making sounds a bit pie in the sky. Nevertheless, there is no democracy in these sectors, yeah. and it's clear that if we are able to present these massive protests, really quite, uh, you know, regime-changing protests, as they were in Sudan and other places, as, as, some, as a phenomenon that reflects the failure of political systems to include people's voices, then, then we're hopefully in the right direction. The second thing is they're really quite violent, dangerous events, often. And people die, lots of people die. You know, in the last year alone, um, something like 100 people died around the world 
in fuel-related protests. So on that count alone, I think uh, organisations that are pushing for fossil fuel subsidy reform need to take responsibility for the fact that when they encourage a price uh, a subsidy cut, this is the very likely outcome. Um, your very good question about why are these prices going up, um, Neil really is the person to answer that. You should speak to him afterwards. But it's, it's largely to do with fossil fuel subsidy reforms. Uh, it's been a, a movement over the last 10, 15 years, would you say, since the, since the last uh, uh, fuel crisis, 2008, or not the last one, but the one before. Um, uh, and, and it's also been linked very much to climate change. The, the fossil fuel subsidies are very irrational. They're very, very expensive. Most governments spend way more on those than they do on all of the other social sectors. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's something like that. Like, it's a really huge spend in most countries, and it's environmentally disastrous, and it's also very pro-rich on the whole. Mm -hmm. Neil, you can have the last word on that. Just to contribute on that, if anybody wants to know more on that, then there is an IDS seminar from last May on specifically that topic, cool. which you can find and download and watch online. Yes. Um, did we answer all of those? John, did we We didn't answer yours because it wasn't for us. <laughs> you can the data on lots of things, of different prices have gone up. We are tracing moments, like key moments, where prices have, have gone up and the responses to that. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, and Davide, behind you is, is correlating... Uh, subsidies with uh, various political and economic outcomes as well. So thank you very much for being here. Much appreciated.